and I'm really, really privileged and, and happy to be here today to talk to you about my stuff. Um, I tried to put a very different talk today together. It's completely different to what I normally give. So uh, probably if you have never seen a, a talk by me, then it won't surprise you. But this is really, I'm trying to go a little bit more, um, uh, I, I'm trying to zoom out and see things from a different, in a different kind of light. And also I'm trying to bring things together that normally don't belong together. And that's why the title is probably a little bit um, weird. Language is not magic. Uh, towards an integrating account, an integrated account of linguistic relativity and embodiment theory. These are two things that I'm really interested in: uh, linguistic relativity and embodiment theory, or um, and co cognitive, well, embodied, embodied cognition. Uh, I will. I don't know if it needs definitions, but I will clarify what I mean by these terms in a, in a minute. Um, okay, let's get going. So the first thing I'd like to say, and and this is basically the statement I will start from. And it's a statement that I don't find controversial, but that a lot of linguists, especially traditional linguists and philosophers, will find sometimes controversial. And uh, and and some, particularly some philosophers who've been who's versed into neuropsychology and and the structure of the mind, you know, the photos of this world. Uh, this is something that would go directly against some of the great theories that have shaped, for example, neuropsychology in the past, uh, you know. 30 or 40 years. So I would argue that language, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't find it at all um, uh, kind of controversial, but I, I want to put that statement out there because it is controversial to some, and I want to know if you find it controversial. Language develops from experiences in the natural world. I mean, it doesn't just come out like out of nowhere. You know, it's not dumped on you, but from some extraterrestrial power or intelligence. Uh, even though I know extraterrestrial forms are very, very um, uh, liked and, and used in, in research, particularly in, the, in, this, in this department. But uh, I'm just making a reference to your little ETs. Um, but um, uh, the language doesn't come from space, arguably, it's not, uh, and it's not uh, uploaded via Wi-Fi into your brains. It comes from direct experiences of the natural world. I think everybody would kind of find to agree a way. And, and therefore, language forms uh, that are created in the process of development must interact with all kinds of other mental representations that we, we hold in our minds. And that includes perception, perception, memory, attention, all the things that our, our cognitive system does and enables us to live in the world with have got to be influenced somehow or related or connected interactively with language. And if I start from there, that kills a number of, 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 uh, of myths about language, which have been held for a very long time at a very high level of intellectual, if you want, uh, scholarship. And particularly the idea that language might be an encapsulated module that stands beside all other functions of the human mind. Okay, so the famous encapsulation theory or Fodorian view of modularity, which is that you have language and then you have other things that the brain does but there's no really cro no real cross talk between the two or the three or the 10. Basically language stands almost as alone and you can break it individually. You can damage language and get some kind of a physic patient. And that person pretty much is completely intact on all other fronts. And though with modern testing of neuropsychology, we've realized soon that this was not tenable and that people who have an impairment with language often have many, many other impairments. That are more or less visible, more or less, more or less detectable and measurable. Yeah. In it, so anyway, the point, with the correlate of this is that it's not encapsulated. I don't conceive language as a module. Uh, for me, it emerges from a neural activity in the brain, and I think most people will agree on that. Um, and more importantly, language representations are embodied because there's no choice. They have to come from somewhere, and the, where they come from is the experience of the natural world building and constructing these representations that become more and more abstract and elaborate and, and detached from their origins, but it doesn't mean that they don't relate to them. It means that they've become more isolated as they become a more mature and more abstract, okay? All right, so I hope we, we get agreement. If we agree, I can stop my talk right now. <laughs> Thank you. But, <laughs> okay, that, you don't want to hear the end. Okay, fine, I'll stop there. Um, so of course, um, one thing is to say that, another thing is to demonstrate it. And I'm very grateful to people like Fodor and, and, and all his followers or, 
or like like thinkers because they give us this opportunity to actually delve into the demonstration part which is how do you actually establish that all, all this is true and that's not easy uh, believe me and i will i'll try to convince you that there is some very good evidence out there so um how do we investigate it how do we show that tangible that there is a tangible link between language representation and other forms of representations by the way this is the core tenet behind linguistic relativity because if language representations influence other types of representations it means that when you manipulate language representations you are co-manipulating other forms of representations for example language can drive attention for example language can influence perception for example just add whatever function of the brain you can think of that is not classically language related, and you're going to find some link and some cross talk between the two. And embodiments, of course, comes in as well, because that is the source of how is basically how language is being built. So what I'm going to try to do here is to integrate or to connect these two things. Language, linguistic relativity, which is the link to other cognitions, if we can call them like that, and to embodiment, that is how it's grounded in experience. Okay, and th this triangle basically is the kind of integration that I'm trying to achieve. And that, for me, that demonstrates that language is not magic. Sorry, I'm 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 telling you that in advance so that we don't have to go to the end for to work to go. To go. You can re you can remember the catch line if you want before we start. Is that that triangle means it's not a magic triangle. It's a triangle that means that language is actually a, a natural. A course of development for the cognitive for the mind, and it's not just miraculously achieved in kind of abstract uh, layers, in in a kind of like philosophical way. Okay, all right. So how do we investigate this? Well, we can introspect, right? Uh, lots of people do that. She's like, ask yourself, you know, does my language influence my mind? When I know a word for something, do I deal with it differently? Do I uh, feel things differently if I have a particular word to describe a feeling? compared to when I don't have that word, okay, etc. I'm not going to give you examples because we could get bogged down into this. It's fascinating, it's, it's a lot of fun, but the problem is that it's away from what I want to do, which is I want to take a very rigorous, hopefully rigorous look at this from a scientific point of view. We can ask participants. I can ask you, what do you think? Do you think language influence uh, your perception? Now, I can ask you, and you, of course, you're politely remaining silent. We could have a big debate, you know, is this blue? Is your is your shirt blue? I um, mean, your your top is it blue or green? Well, we can have. And what about the person next to you? So, it's more like green, right? But this one uh, is. I'm not sure. And then we could have a debate for that for hours. And you say, but come on, I know what blue looks like, and you know that is blue. I'm sorry, but no, it's green. And we can go forever like this. Why? Because we can have access to the perceptions of the people having this discussion. No access to perception because it's a subjective thing. So we can discuss and debate it, but mind you, you can generalize this concept to pretty much every other field of language, um, basically on linguistic relativity. Uh, is this is this really a cup or a mug? Uh, is this really a, a, a you know a wine glass or a, a, a water glass? And so on and so forth. You can go out like this for hours because this thing is intermediate, and I can't really judge it. And and the Spanish people would look at you and say, of course it's a wine glass. And the British to say, ah, I don't know, they have glasses. I mean, what's the difference? And it can be a very interesting discussion. Um, so we, we, can't, we can't just rely on what people tell you or, or direct interactions because they are not going to uh, go anywhere. So it's produced an endless philosophical debate. We don't have any data. We don't really have evidence. And we have no consensus. We can also simply observe language structure and usage which is the corpus kind of analysis or exploratory way of doing things. And that's very valuable because without observations, we don't have a starting point, we don't have a hypothesis. So I'm not saying it's not, but it's not good. However, there's a problem with that. We, we have no access to the perception. We can uh, if, in, make an inventory of what language terms look like and how they disagree across languages and across contexts, but it doesn't help us work out how we perceive the world differently when we use these languages because perception is not something that is part of the corpus. It's within us as uh, observers. Um, so we can't measure cognitive processing just based on uh, language observations. So we can only speculate, and that's, that speculation is idiosyncratic, that is self-contained within language itself. So I'm not arguing that this is the right way. We can test participants. Wow, that's a good idea. Let's do an experiment. 
And we can test password and see if their behavior is influenced by overt language manipulation. So I'm going to tell them, OK, click on the blue button and or, or the blue object, or tell me if these two things are more or less different. And you've heard of experiments like that. They've been done many times for many years, and they show some trends, some effects. The problem is that they're extremely blurry. And there's another problem is that they're a little bit trivial. And I would argue. And why are they trivial? Because that's the purpose of language, is to distinguish things in the world. So if you use language in your experiment to tell, oh, look, are these things blue? Well, you're actually dragging behind. You're actually emphasizing the connection between blue and another process. So you may be artificially creating that effect because you are not measuring perception. You're measuring the language that floats around a particular process. So how do you get at it? Well, to get at it, I would argue you have to do two things, or at least two things that I have done <laughs> and that I, I think I, I would recommend. First, you have to test participants on nonverbal tasks. And that's where linguists sometimes go on their, you know, how do you call it, big horses, we say in French, but I don't know what you say in English. It doesn't matter. Uh, you get the idea. They, are, they can be quite upset, say, what do you mean? You're excluding language? You're going to do a nonverbal task? How is that linguistically re relevant? Well, the thing is, that if you want to know that perception is affected by language at a, at a cognitive nonverbal level, you have no choice. You have to look at what happens on perception or decision making or whatever you want, irrespective of language representations. So you have to detach yourself from language to test the effects of language that are not linked directly to language, basically avoiding that problem. You follow me? Okay. And the second point I argue that you have to test participants outside consciousness. Now, it doesn't mean that you knock them unconscious, which is clear. <laughs> what I mean by that is that you, may, you need to make sure that you look at the process, how the brain processes information, without them knowing what you're testing. And why is that so important? Because as soon as awareness is involved, you have something called verbalization. You must have heard about this, is that when you are thinking overtly about objects or, or, or things or, or, or schemas, you are using language all the time. So if you are seeing an effect on, if your, your measure of cognition is, involves language and is conscious, basically you may be looking at the, an effect of language on language and you're in a loop that will never come out. You have to, to distantiate yourself from this. That means that you have to look at nonverbal processing and unconscious processing. And this is what I, I'm offering to you to do. Today is to get on a little trip through a, a couple of, a few experiments there's about four main experiments I want to show you where we did exactly that. And we repeatedly found effects that are not, that are literally impossible to explain by uh, within language itself. There are uh, uh, interactions that are uh, particularly interesting, and I want to show them to you. So um, first, in this first part, we're going to look at how we can test participants using mostly Nonverbal task. It doesn't mean that most tasks are nonverbal. It means that the task is mostly nonverbal. Okay, I want to clarify that meaning. And why I'm saying that mostly, I would put it. I, I could put it on every single experiment or every single experiment that's been run in history, because you can't really run an experiment with that language. Have you noticed that? It's very rare that you welcome participants like. <laughs> no. Okay, and you're going to struggle. Huh? Because the moment you have to give instructions, it's going to get really complicated if you have to do it all by gesture. By the way, when you do by gestures, what you're doing is you're communicating meaning, you're signing, and you're basically trying to, you know, priming language. So they're actually, so the minute you have to remove language completely from the equation, there is no experiment. So that means that I'm, gonna, I'm not going to show you an experiment where there is no language because it's impossible to realize. But what we're going to do is, and this is what I've found, easily 10 years of my life or my work life doing is diverge, like take the attention of the participant and shift it towards something else. Language is still there, but it's been completely marginalized, almost made a completely unreliable, irrelevant, redundant, uninteresting. Or it's just a, a phenomenon that appears there, but all the focus of attention is on something else. That's one way. Not perfect. But if you find something better, please contact me because I'm interested. So uh, this is the first uh, study I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, this is Kathy uh, Shangao. 
my colleague from, um, uh, from Chengdu in, in China, and she visited my lab for one year. And we did this experiment where we looked at verbal feedback. As you can tell me, wait a minute, so you have language manipulation? Yes, but verbal feedback was completely accessory to the experiment. We, did, we, we didn't even mention it. We just said it, we, they could see it was there, but the focus of attention was on a game, okay? And that game was the following. You have on each trial uh, um, two possibilities. You have either you're gonna earn a certain number of points or you're gonna lose the number of points. It's basically what we call the 50-50 gamble, all right? Now, if it's you're gonna win 100 points or lose 50 points, you might be tempted to play because you're gonna win more than you're gonna lose. But losing 50 points might be a lot depending on how many points there are in the experiment. And you will figure that very quickly. Okay. Now, after this, um, you, you can choose to bet or not. If you don't bet, it's fine. You don't have any feedback. You just go to the next bet. But uh, if you bet, then you have two possibilities. Either you win or you lose. In this case, because it's more fun, we say they lose. That is where the feedback comes in. The feedback is either in English, which is their L2, second language, because they're Chinese English bilinguals, or in Chinese. So they see a word for, of Chinese, which says, oh, bad luck. There's about 10 words used in experiments. They don't know that this is the critical manipulation. Of course, they can see it. It's not like hidden. But they don't know that this is the critical manipulation. What we want to know is what happens when the brain gets feedback in their L1 or L2, Chinese or English in relation to the outcome and how their behavior in terms of betting is, can be modulated or modified. This is decision-making. It's a non-verbal task. We can argue forever, but it's very simple. It's maps, okay? If you have a big win and a small loss, you should bet. If you have a big, a small win and a big loss, you should never bet. And then in the middle, there's kind of transitions. And of course, that's exactly what we find. So here, when the loss increases, as you can see, bigger losses, and lower rewards, you can see that the number of, sorry, number, sorry, the lower, the rewards are here. So the triangles, these are the lower rewards, the rewards, and this is the bigger losses. Then you see that people are very unlikely to play. But if you have a big, big gain, like a hundred, and a small loss, you're very likely to play. That makes sense? Okay. So this graph is exactly what you find in game theory and in betting behavior. This is exactly what you would see. So you see that they are betting exactly as you would see in other experiments, which are completely non-verbal, or at least as non-verbal as you can make them, because it's just about make, estimating your likelihood of winning. But what is fascinating is this. When they get feedback in English, it doesn't matter whether they got no feedback because they didn't play. They got positive or negative feedback. The likelihood of them playing in the next trial is the same. There's no change. It's always around 0.6 because the experiment is biased towards winning a little bit to make sure that we have uh, interest. Because if you bias it towards losing, people get depressed and they don't want to play it anymore. Mm -hmm. They say, thank you very much. I don't want to play because I'm losing all the time. So you bias it to, towards winning a bit. You can do that because you can choose what uh, gambles you show. And we can ensure that they're engaged with the game. And they feel that they have power and that they can control because that's one of the things that happens when people start winning they have the hot hand effect they think wow i'm on a winning streak i'm going to get that one too but what is fascinating is this and guys i hope you're going to be a bit scared by this because i'm telling you this was the most scary result i got in my career like the single most scary graph i ever saw in my career because i couldn't believe it so you look at chinese feedback so now they're getting feedback in chinese right their first language, they are Chinese English bilinguals. And when they get positive feedback in Chinese, they are 10% more likely to bet on the next trial, irrespective of what the trial is. It doesn't matter whether they're likely to win or lose. It doesn't matter. Across the board, just getting positive feedback in Chinese motivates them to the point that they are likely to take a risk, 10% more. Now, uh, very in, uh, it's been recorded, but there's nothing I can do about this, but um, well, I, I could just shut up, but no, I'm going to say it. Imagine if you were a little bit uh, inspired here. If you, for example, are the manager of a poker site, online website, yeah? Uh, you could use that if you were a bit smart. You could recall the languages of the players, and you could make sure that whenever they get positive feedback, they get it in their one. When they get negative feedback, 
you can either switch to L2 or just give them in L1 because it makes no difference. But if you can record their language and interact with them in their language, in theory, and if that, of course, transfers to other languages, I've never done the experiments, basically, you're going to increase your profit by 10%. Wow, 10%, uh, depending on the return of your website, might be quite useful. Um, this, in my opinion, is a beautiful example of an interaction between language representations. You have language feedback and decision making. And there is no reason to think that it's a simple effect of language on language because the decision making part doesn't really involve language. It's not like participant thinking, I'm going to press that button and reasoning all verbally. It, there's no need for that and it would be very weird. Okay. And by the way, if it was just that, you should find exactly the same effects in the two languages. Or at least if it was just an effect of verbalization, it's more complex than that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to startle anyone. You, that, I love this Yeti look that you had. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't say that either. Um, if you was online, you could see that. That would be fun. Um, so uh, um, now I'm jumping uh, away to a, a different um, experiment. And voluntarily, I'm far away from the previous one. This previous one was showing you an effect of language input on decision making. Now I'm going to show you something completely different. I'm going to show you when I get language input in a, or language in a context in a particular uh, one of my languages as a bilingual, you're going to see that it flexes the way I perceive or conceptualize events or objects or perception. In this case, it's one example amongst many that we've looked at, but this one is about motion perception. And I'm sure you're familiar with this study, so I'm not going to spend, has, has anyone never heard about this study in the room? Good. So that gives me an opportunity to actually present it. Um, so sorry for the others. Uh, please bear with us. We won't be long. So this is a study that uh, Panos uh, conducted a few years back, about six, seven years ago. And actually, yeah, almost 10 now. And um, this, in this study, uh, what he did was he presented events, uh, motion events, that is little videos, in which somebody, for example, was moving here, but they're not moving toward a particular goal. So we call it low goal orientation because they are walking on the road, basically, right? And here, the case is where the goal is reached. So it's very high goal orientation because they enter, for example, a porch or a door. So clearly they are going somewhere. We can see where they're going. And there are some cases, the X, the A and B, low and high. And then you have this case where the video is ambiguous. You don't know if that person is going towards that car or not. I, I don't know about this video. I've never seen the video, actually. I've only seen the, the stills. But I think, I think they would be probably closer to the car if they were going to the car. But it's kind of ambiguous. Maybe they are going to the car and they're just checking that nobody scratched the door or something. So you have this kind of ambiguity where they don't reach the goal. There is a goal, but it's not clear whether they're going there. And what you're asking participants to do is, after seeing these two videos, when they see that one, they have to choose which one they think is closer. It's very smart in the way that it's double layered nonverbal. First of all, you're observing a movement. Second, you have to say what this movement looks like. So we're not talking about goals. We're not telling them if they're reaching the goal or not. We're just saying, do you think this is more similar to this or that? So it's a similarity judgment on motion events. It's very hard to think that language is primarily involved, you know, like, do you think people are obsessed at describing every step of the way of the video? It's unlikely. Okay, and why did they do that experiment? Because in German, the, uh, it's a goal-oriented language. That is, the goal is often and generally uh, actually presented in the grammar. That is, when you say somebody is walking on the road, you can't really say somebody, you can do it, you can paraphrase it. But the most likelihood is you're going to give the objective, the, uh, the, the destination of the movement. So it's a goal-oriented, if you want, uh, grammar. Whereas in English, you have the option, you can, of course, specify the goal in English. He's walking to the library, fine. We know where the goal is. But he could say, oh, he's just walking. He's walking around, he's walking on the road, he's walking, um, to, he's, he's walking this afternoon. You can perfectly say that. So you don't need to specify a goal. And therefore, it's not as goal-oriented as German, as you can see. And so the question is, if people, if first of all, let's compare Germans and English, and this is what they did. So here you have monolingual Germans and monolingual English, and you can see that the motion compression preference, that is the choice 
of videos that finish with the goal, right? The, the, so that was the B version where the person entered the door. Of course, there's lots of videos, but it's just uh, an example. Was well, much more likely for German monolinguals than for English monolinguals. And there's basically a difference of almost 20%. So it's a very steady, you know, pretty good dip. Yeah. What is absolutely mesmerizing is that if they test bilinguals in German, they look a bit like the German monolinguals. They're actually not far. And in fact, there's no significant difference here. But if you test the same bilinguals in English, they start looking more like the English, and there's a clear drop of 10%. That is incredible. The language context switches the way they perceive goal-orientedness. That's very impressive. But well, wait, because it got scary when I saw this graph for the first time. I almost fell on my chair. I, I wasn't worried about it. I just thought, this is unbelievable. What they did here, they asked participants to use verbal interference. It's a very weird task. I, I used to hate it, but after this experiment, I started to kind of like it. Uh, I never used that because I think it's very complex uh, psychologically. What they're doing is they're asking passers to count backwards in th every three digits from 100 in one language or the other, and to do the task at the same time. You're going to say, what the heck is that? It's a really complex dual task. There's a very good reason for that. It's because it's a nonverbal task. They can do it, by the way. It's not that difficult. They just have to say whether the videos resemble A or B. And they don't have to worry about verbalizing anything. So they can actually do that, go 100, 97, 94, 91. Don't check me up on the maps, but you get the idea. And they can do that in English or in German because they're bilingual. So here, what they were doing is they were doing it in English first. And then halfway, they switched to German. Now, when they were doing it in English, the German pattern response comes out. And then, midway, they shift to German and they drop. Now, if they start with German, they look like English. And when they switch halfway to German, uh, to English, sorry, they jump up to German. What the heck is happening here? When you are suffering verbal interference in a language, it looks like your mind is free to think in the other language. And therefore, it looks like the nonverbal processing that you see in, in monolinguals or bilinguals operating in that language. It's mind boggling, right? And that's why the paper uh, was called two, uh, um, two Languages, Two Minds, because the idea is that there are two systems operating in parallel. And depending on the level of business of one language, the other is available to do stuff. OK. Now, uh, this is the, third, the end of part one. I just wanted to show you very quickly, like in a flash, another study, which is very more recent, where we looked at, uh, with um, one of my PhD students when we were young, we looked at Chinese English bilinguals in, when they are faced with the, the, basically the necessity to tell the truth or to lie. And we manipulated that in a game of very complex game of coin betting. It was a nightmare to set up. It took months to get it right. But, we think it's working. I mean, at least the patterns look, look coherent. And when you ask participants to basically, when they say the truth, they are forced to tell the truth. They have to. But when they lie, they are invited to lie. And these are the trials in which they lie, not the ones in which they tell the truth, because they can also tell the truth in these conditions. So the idea is we have a pure truth, which is you have to tell the truth and you're telling the truth. And then you have a pure lie because you could lie and you chose to lie. You get the idea? And what we see is that for the lie, we don't get, we, we, we predicted that this would go that way. That is, the proportion of English shoes would be greater when you lie. That's what we predicted. We thought they were more likely to lie in their second language because, you know what? I don't need to suffer the consequences. It's my second language. However, what we found, which was actually a mirror image effect, and that means the same thing, we think, is that they are more likely to tell the truth in Chinese. So when they are getting the truth, they have to say what it is, and because it's imposed on them, if not, they're going to get a penalty, they are more likely to choose Chinese. And that, I think, is pretty extraordinary. What we don't know is whether this is a um, cultural effect or whether it is a generic effect. And we need to find out. Believe me, we are on it. Part two. Uh, part two, I'm going to do the second promise, or start the second promise, which is to, to test participants outside consciousness. Now, why is that so important? I, I don't need to say it again. I've told you at the beginning. But 
uh, you understand that everything I did before, participants knew exactly what was going on. They could read the words, they, they understand the words, they could reason it, they could come, you know, overtly analyze the situation. And so these behavioral measurements, I, I've got the risk that they are still um, guided by internal reflection, by awareness, by strategic moves. And what we want to do is to see what happens when participants don't have a clue about what we're manipulating. They cannot work it out, or at least it's very difficult. And we're going to debrief them, and we're going to take measurements that actually are automatic. They just, they completely detach themselves from awareness. The first thing we're going to use is eye tracking. It's very good. I've noticed that we are extremely bad at controlling our eyes. By the way, it's a good thing, because a lot of uh, the things our eyes do are uh, automatic, completely automatic and unconscious. And that's a very good thing, because if we have to control our eyes consciously, we, we basically, we spend probably three quarters of our mental energy doing that, which is a shame because we have lots of other things to do. I'm not going to make a list. So that's a very good thing, but it means that these measurements are very much um, implicit and unconscious. So uh, the, the, this is an opportunity to introduce a wide range of experiments that I've done, but I'm just going to show you one with eye tracking um, because um, I think it's fascinating the fact that um, language, um, language representations interact in the, in the mind, you can, of course, access a translation. You can actually translate a word, or you can use words strategically, or you can switch between languages when you're bilingual. What is very weird is that your brain might be accessing some information without you knowing. That is a little bit more scary or a bit more complex. And that means that in as much as language verbal feedback can influence decision making, you can have also language influence decision making unconsciously, not just what you choose, but also what happens in your brain at the, at the neural circuitry level outside your consciousness. Uh, you think I'm talking science fiction. Wait until you see the results of this experiment and tell me if, if you interpret it differently. So this is the experiment. Uh, by the way, uh, strike of genius from my colleague uh, and my ex-undergrad, uh, PhD, master, postdoc, colleague, and now reports back, that's crazy. Uh, okay, now, here's the experiment. He came up with that experiment, and when he presented it in my office, I just burst into laughter. It was like, like, you've gone one step too far, man. This is never going to work. No way. So here's the idea. You present a fixation cross, as he's come in his kind of experiments, and then you show three words, and either three, three circles, four circles, three squares, or four squares. I'm showing you the version that we polished together and thought about a lot, right? But the concept was that, and basically it was a really good concept. I think the originally you wanted just one circle and one square. I thought, hmm, you might want to introduce some variability here about size of words, not to make it too obvious, too simple, even though it's quite obvious. What you have to do is to press the button when there are circles or squares on the, on the slide. I think everybody in the room can do it, right? So when you see that, you press because there are three circles. If there were four circles, three squares or four squares, you have to press. And then uh, from time to time, you see four words. And the instruction when you see four words is do nothing, which is my favorite instructions. Like, just don't, don't worry about it. Wait until you have this one. Of course, this is the dummy part. We don't care what they're doing here because it's really easy to do. And we know what they're doing. They're looking here and they're saying press. The question is what happens when they're looking this because there's something hidden. Reason, the word reason in Chinese, I couldn't dare pronounce it. Could someone indulge me? Yuan Yin. Yuan Yin, I can't do the tongues, but it's a matter. Okay, so if you say that, as a matter of fact, the first character here is the character for circles in Chinese. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have a series of words in that experiment that relate to circle. They don't mean circle. Because reason doesn't mean circle, it just contains the character in Chinese for circle. And you have another set of words that contain the character for square. And are they going to look at this particularly long? When it's presented, they don't even have to read it. Because you know what? There's no circles or squares. You can ignore. Wait, just look, look up. Wait, because there's nothing to do. These are the critical conditions, the critical words, because they are the words where there is a link to the actual target in the experiment. And these are what we call the um, control words, where there's no link to the, the current task. Do you follow me? 
Now look at the results. This is block one and this is block two, and this is the average. I don't know why I put the average because basically they're all the same. So nothing to special to say. In the first half of the experiment and in the second half, you see that changing the bilinguals spend 100 milliseconds more, one third of the time more on the critical words, the words that relate to circle and square than the, the others. And I'm not, I, mean, I didn't make that up, but look at this. This is the monolingual English in the same task, okay? I mean, if you have ever seen graphs that shows you a null effect, you know, I'd, I'd be almost tempted to say, you know what, we're gonna call it a, a actually true null effect. We're gonna validate uh, the alternative hypothesis that there is no difference. H zero is validated. <laughs> um, do you agree that there's nothing here? I mean, clearly. And this is a massive difference. It's 100 milliseconds. So they are interested in these words, but do you think they know why? They don't have a clue what we're testing. I mean, we debrief them to the bone. We wanted to know exactly what they were doing. And they say, I detected the circles and the squares and I press. And this is not the hardest experiment I've ever done, you know, and that's it. <laughs> and you could use them as much as you want. They didn't know that these words related back to Chinese. Okay. I think it's a sign that at an unconscious level, language influence, uh, uh, there are interactions between language representations that completely escape your volition, but are driven by links between different levels of cognition. Here, a, a, a very complex process accessing representation. And you might say, oh, wait a minute. Of course, it always happens. It's automatic. And actually, we were uh, we published a paper in 2007 showing exactly that for the first time, that there's automatic access to translation in bilinguals. But it doesn't always happen. As uh, we have shown also with the Yanjing Wu, and that's just been replicated by Wan Yu uh, Zhang in, in uh, Chenggu again um, re recently in a paper that we published. We showed that when bilinguals are uh, Chinese English bilinguals are exposed to uh, an emotional word, a negative word in English, the translation access stops. Mystery. And basically, the brain of the Chinese English bilingual exposed to an English negative word says, Thank you very much. I'll pass. I don't want to know what it is in Chinese. The participant is unaware of that, but we have the proof, and we've replicated this now twice, three times actually. We've replicated it three times, so we know it's happening. The brain refuses to access translation in, in Chinese, L1. Because you know what? It's negative, and I can do without knowing what it is in Chinese. But it's the brain on its own making that decision for the participant, which is almost scary, right? And here, what is amazing in this study is that we show that if we reverse the order of primes and targets that are emotional, we can see that we get the priming by emotional if the emotional valence is presented as a target. So this is the target, and you see the two emotional condition priming. But if you have the emotional prime, the emotional manipulation at the prime level, you get priming when the uh, object when the prime is positive, but if it's negative, it stops. Which means that it's not that the brain doesn't want to know what the word is in L1. It will access the word in L1, irrespective of whether it's positive or negative. But what will happen is when it's negative, it decides that it's not going to translate the next word. This is the mechanism. It says, well, guys, I don't want to know what the next translation is because, you know, I didn't like that. I didn't like feeling the negativity of that word in L1. So the next word you present, I'm not going to translate it, irrespective of its valence, which is completely mad. Anyway. OK, and I'm almost done. OK, we're doing OK for time. Now, of course, uh, this is what I spent most of my career doing, was to look at brain activities. And of course, why would I do that? Not because I'm fascinated by brain activity in, in, in essence, but because it's the best way to measure unconscious processing. What brain activity tells you is the state of perceptual representations or conscious, uh, um, basically, access to conscious representations completely independently of overt awareness or awareness from the participant. That's an, a priceless uh, insight. And again, it's addressing the same point as I developed in the introduction. First, I need to very quickly, like I'm talking with quickly, it's like going to be one minute. Is anyone here not really familiar with, for example, event-related potentials, ERPs? Or are you all familiar? Kelly, you can't put your hand up. <laughs> okay. Now, if 
If anyone is, I'd, I'd rather have this one minute of a view because it helps you understand. The next experiment is probably the most complex experiment I've ever run in my entire career. It's really complicated. So if you miss, if you don't understand this, we're not going to go anywhere. So I need to explain that for a second. So EEG is a bit of a miracle because it's you put electrodes on the head and you can record basically brain activity because it diffuses through the layers, through the dura, through the skull, through the scalp, and you can actually measure it. It diffuses in a mass, let's be clear. You have billions of neurons, and what you're measuring is from a few electrodes, generally about 60, uh, you know, you're looking at electrical variations. These variations are a reflection of what happens in the brain, but they are not directly the brain activity, simply because you have billions of neurons combining to produce it, right? So, um, and also with, with your 60 electrodes, you have zero chance of reconstructing where it comes from. Whatever people tell you, don't believe them. If they tell you they know where the source of the signal is, it's a joke. I don't believe it. I don't care. I've, I've studied that a lot. <laughs> anyway, I have my opinions about this. But nevertheless, what you have is a trace, a reflection of movements of activity directly in the brain. And what is really important is real time. You're getting the activity of the brain as it unfolds. So that's a fantastic tool. Imagine that this was the state of your brain right now. Beautiful, peaceful water. Yeah. Um, now I'm going to present you with a stimulus. Um, here's a picture. Here's a sound. And when I do that, you're going to see a distortion of the activity in the brain. So that's the ripple marks in the water. Sorry for the analogy, but I'm trying to get it accessible. So I just threw a pebble or a stone in the water, and the distortion is the response of your brain to that event, right? Wonderful. So I show you a picture, I saw this distortion. Oh, and I see how your brain reacted to this. Except there's a slight problem. Just a slight problem. This is the state of your brain. <laughs> and you can always throw your pebbles, you know. Throw your pebble. Oops, where is that? No, I'm going to throw another one, right? Yeah, throw another one. Oops, no. So basically, you can do that many times, and you'll see absolutely nothing. Except that there is a wonderful law of physics that helps us here. Is that when you throw a pebble in there, and I kind of... Well, it's not the best video because, of course, it's taken from a boat. They are in the middle of a storm. Um, if you throw your pebble, you're moving, so you have to take into account the movement. But if only the sea was moving, you can actually see the pebble marks, but they are just incredibly noisy. And what you can do, and this is the principle of the RPs, is instead of throwing one pebble, you're going to throw 40. One, two, three, four. And every time you record what happens, um, and the clever bit is that the things that happen always happen because the water, you know, it distorts in the, when it's hit by the pebble. But the noise is always happening as well, except the noise is random, your pebble is fixed. And that in maths is a very good news because when something is fixed, you can average it together and it comes out and noise averages to zero. It's a law of maths, of, of signal theory. So if you average over 40 or 50 traps, what comes out is what we call the ERP, it's a clean wave, which is the theoretical wave that would happen, going back to this, because I shouldn't have left the whole thing because you, you were starting to get hypnotized by the sea. But if you go back here, basically you're getting this signal, that we, the theoretical one, because every noise, the rest of the noise has been averaged to zero. This is where the ERP is, and it's very, very cool. Why? Because, for example, you have waves of ERPs that can be modulated by a particular cognitive mechanism. That gets very hot. Compare that with fMRI, where you will never know ever what the cognitive process underpinning the activation change in the brain are. It's impossible. Because you have a set of activation and you don't know what it means. You can get some guesses. If it's very localized around the auditory areas and the visual areas, yeah, okay, they hear something and they see something. The minute you go a bit further from that into the more complex levels of cognition, forget MRI. It doesn't tell you anything. We can discuss that too, that later. ERPs, you have the N400. It's a negative wave peaking at 400 milliseconds, and it's modulated by meaning. If you have, a, a, if you're prepared to see something, if you have some anticipation about the meaning of something, the N400 is going to be reduced. It shows you that the brain has facilitated access to semantics or to the meaning of the object that you're seeing. It can be a nonverbal object as well. And so basically, you have a, an index of semantic processing, of meaning processing by the brain. I mean, how priceless is that? And you can predict every single time you do a manipulation with meaning, you're going to get an 400 reduction. That's pretty cool. 
And that's what we used in this experiment with Yang Li, who was my PhD student a few years back, where we went as complicated as we could um, because we wanted to have fun mostly, but it was our opportunity to link linguistic relativity and embodiment. It was the actually first real bridge between the two. And so what did we do? Um, after, I don't know how many discussions we had, but I discovered something that was very, very interesting. This is the timeline. And here is a very short introduction to spatial temporal metaphors in Chinese. Um, in Chinese, as in most Indo-European languages, the future is in front and the past is in the back. And I think you'll agree all around the table, whatever kind of flavor of languages and culture you have, mostly in most cases, you'll see the future in front and the, 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 the past in the back. So if, if now is here, uh, tomorrow is obviously here. I'm not going to, this is going to, I'm just going to move them very quickly. Obviously, um, this is how you would organize things. So the year after next is further in front than uh, next year and the day after tomorrow and so on, and re the reverse for the past. However, something very odd is happening in Chinese. This word here, this uh, term here, the day after tomorrow in Chinese is hu tian. I hope you agree for those who know Chinese. However, Hu Tian means back day. Word for word, Hu Tian means back day. Then you might think, wait a minute, it should be front day because it's the day after tomorrow, so it's in the front. Uh, and better, because Chinese is a very logical language, <laughs> the day after yesterday happens to be front day. <laughs> Clever. Now you might say, wait a minute, why do they do that to themselves? I mean, really, it's complicated. And do you agree that it's true, right? And you may not never think about this because it's just a label. I mean, who cares? Back day, front day, who cares? It's just a label. I'm using for the day after tomorrow or the day before yesterday. No problem. Yes, except that there's a reason for it. Historically, uh, Chinese, you go back 3,000 years, was not an ego-moving reference for time, but had a world-moving uh, reference frame for time. Is that in ancient China, you'd be sitting in a chair and time, the world would be passing by. That's the passing of time. What you see is what has been. So it's the past. It's in front of you because you can see it. And what is in your back has not been seen yet because you are the, the world is passing by and you don't see what's coming. So that's the world reference view. And therefore, the back is the unseen. The, the, the future and the front is the past, is what has been seen. Now, it's also a perceptual reference, actually. Now, if you now consider the new reference, it's an ego frame of reference. You evolve in the, in the world, and what you're going to see is what you're going towards. And what you've seen already is what you've left behind. So it's a complete change of, of reference. Because 3,000 years ago, Chinese had this reference, it kept some signs in the language. By the way, it doesn't stop at words, stop, uh, at days. It also concerns years, because the year after next is Hunyan, and Qian, I can't pronounce that, sorry, but Qian Yan is the, day, the, the year before last. So you can see that this reversal is happens, happens for both days and years. Now, when I discovered this, I was going, I was fidgety because I thought like, wait a minute, this is crazy. We could do the most incredible experiment. We could look at what happens when we, with embodiment, when we present things that come from the front space and the back space and the uh, words, obviously, words about time, but that are congruent or incongruent with the spatial expectation carried by the metaphor. And so this is how we came up with that design. We put a participant in the lab here, a beautiful Chinese English bilingual, as you can see. Um, of course, this is a, a, just a, an image. And we played from the front a year, for example, 2020, or from the back, the equivalent, and that could be in Chinese or English, it can be either. And we asked them to make a deceptively simple decision. Here's the decision. If the year you hear is one year in the future or one year in the past, that is one year away from now, you press button one. If the year you hear is two years away from now, so the experiment was, for example, in 2018. So if you hear 2019, 2017, you press one. 
If you hear 2020 or 2016, you press two. I don't, I don't think it's difficult. By the way, uh, success rate, 98% on all participants. There was the easiest task they've ever done. They can count to one and two, no problem. And they, as long as they don't get the buttons mixed up, they can do it. However, we're doing a trick on them because that's the year after next, isn't it? And that's next year. This one doesn't map on the front back axis, but the year after next, as, it, as a matter, is back here. So when I show it from the front, does it cause a problem to the brain? Because it's from the front and actually it says, it means back here, or at least actually the metaphor, the spatial temporal metaphor means back here. So if I hear it from the front, I'm gonna have a clash between back and front, right? Whereas if that year, which is in, in the future, comes from the back, oh, my brain is gonna be happy in theory, because you know what? And how does it translate? It translates by N400 variations in theory, because the N400 captures the level of semantic match between a situation, a prediction, and what you get. So we should see modulation of the N400 if the brain is making these predictions. <laughs> Did you follow me? I know it's tough, but it's really worth it. I'm gonna pass this, I'll just explain that. Basically, it works for days or for years. This is for days because we also had, this is where the experiment was a nightmare because it was day dependent. So for every day, the participants coming in, Liang needed to have all the stimuli set up and not screw up that the day was right. It was a Wednesday, okay, it's so Wednesday, so Thursday is tomorrow and Friday is the day after tomorrow. You see the problem, right? And you have to do that. You have to have all your lists. And if you screw up on the day of, uh, well, too bad you can throw up the participant because, <laughs> sorry, it was, a bit, it was a mess up. Okay, now, these are the results. Whether you know ERPs or not, I think it's kind of accessible. I hope so. This is participants in Chinese. They hear the year in Chinese. And it's for, I think it's for, this is for days, not for years. It's for years, for days. I forgot to put that on the slide, but I remember. So it's for days. For days, you can see the wave for congruent and incongruent. So it's simplified. Congruent is the, the, the word the sound of the word comes from the front when actually it's front day or from the back when it's back day. And incongruence is the reverse. It's actually correct vis-a-vis -vis orientation of future and, and past, but it's incorrect vis-a-vis -vis the special metaphor in Chinese. And nothing. This was the condition in which we expected a massive effect. Nothing, zero, okay. Not depressed, we thought, okay, we need to look at the English in English because maybe it works because the English in English, of course, they don't know special metaphors in Chinese, but we expected them to have a clear effect for front, back with past and future. So if you show something that's in the future and comes from the back, they should go like, whoa, absolutely nothing. I'm not showing you the data, nothing. The, Chinese, the English didn't see anything. At this point, Yang was depressed because she had been tested for, testing for one month and a half. She said, nothing worked. And I said, well, let's just look at the Chinese English in English, just for fun. Just, just look at them in English. We never know, you know, I didn't expect much. These are the Chinese English bilinguals in English. And what you see is that exactly at 400 milliseconds, which is the end 400 peak, on the correct electrode, which are central, six central, could be nine central, same effect. You have a variation, which is significant, between congruent and congruent, which is in the correct direction, which is bigger than 400. What it means is that, when they saw, when they heard, sorry, the English word for the year in the wrong place, their brain didn't like it. But he didn't like it exactly on time. There is, there's zero delay. It basically was processing our information full on. It was locating the word, obviously, which is irrelevant. We didn't ask them to say anything about the direction of the word. They, they don't have to take into account where it comes from. We don't care. But the brain still did that. It extracted where it comes from. It matched it with the meaning of the word. It accessed the spatial temporal metaphor in Chinese and say, wait a minute, that's back, that's back here. Why does it come from the front? Bam. And by the way, you might say, wait a minute, this is, you have put all the effects together to show it. No, you can split them and they are identical. This is where I couldn't believe, I could not believe this result. I was just looking at the screen thinking, this is crazy because we thought the experiment had failed. You split that, you get, front and back and back and front, and you get exactly the symmetrical effect. They just reverse. 
So clearly, it's a completely overlapped, but basically it's rotated and it's completely the same. There's no interaction. And wait, you say, okay, great, we were lucky maybe, but surely it didn't work for days, but for years, because that was days. And here are the years. Years, nothing in Chinese. In English, English, nothing. And here, in bilinguals, in English, the effect. And you're going to tell me, hey, wait a minute, that's at 700 milliseconds. How's that? Oh, that is very good. <laughs> because there's 20 in front of 2020. And we even predicted this because we cross applied the simile. All the simile have the same 20 in front. Because we knew that if we had different recordings for 2020, 2019, and 2018, they could predict what was coming up based on the sound form of the beginning. So we cross priced them. The 20 was always the same. They couldn't predict, but it delayed the onset of information, which means that it had to delay by about 250 milliseconds. Well, exactly where it should be, because we measured 20 and it lasts 20 on 250 milliseconds. So in fact, this happened exactly where it should. And we replicated four ways again. At this point, I'm telling you, it is not random. It's happened. It happened? I don't know. <laughs> Your, the brain of these bilinguals in English thought, wait a minute, I need to rephrase that in Chinese. I'm going to access my special meta metaphor because it's really useful because it's English. I don't, I don't do English. I do Chinese. So I'm going to reverbalize that. I'm going to access metaphor. Access metaphor. Oh, oh wait a minute. That sound came from the front, but it means back day. So I'm not happy. All this perfectly on time because 400 milliseconds on the clock. But what it means is that you have full embodiment. You know, perceptual representations are completely taken into account in higher level cognition, and you have linguistic creativity brought together, bridged for the first time. I hope I convinced you. Um, and I'm going to skip. I'm sorry, you fan. I have to skip this because I'm late. So please. Please forgive me. Uh, but there's a really cool paper that you can look at language learning, which is very cool paper on special on special meta. Uh, actually, it's not on special. Yes, it's on special metaphors, but you can look at it. Anyway, so I conclude now. All the presentation experiment, all the present experiment, even those that involved language deliberately, participants were didn't know that language was the core, the core matter. They it was irrelevant. You know, even the feedback in the Chinese English bilinguals. I mean. At the beginning, they just didn't care that the language was involved. They didn't realize it was so crucial. And they had no idea what we were testing. All the, all the time, the language was kind of like a module on the side, but not a cognitive module on the side, um, if you can see the joke. So uh, conclusion, language interacts with all other cognitive processes in the brain, no exception. As far as I'm concerned, there's no limits. Memory, attention, uh, um, uh, conceptual processing in all, in all these possible ways, decision making, name it. Um, it can and it does affect behavior, but that goes beyond language awareness. It's not because you're aware in your language that something's happening that you have an effect. You have the effect all the way independent of your awareness. And such interactions are unconscious, ubiquitous, and deeply embodied. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks for